Hello, welcome to this Mitchell Talks, and it's my honor to introduce the Secretary of Health and Mental Health for the state of Oklahoma, who also is the Chief Executive Officer of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, Kevin Corbett. Mr. Secretary, good to have you. Thank you, Scott. Great to be with you. Hey, can I unpack this, the titles that you have? Because we all know what the health outcomes are in Oklahoma, and there's a lot of work to be done. But let's start first with the first title, Secretary of Health and Mental Health. In what capacity do you serve? You serve in the governor, obviously, but what is your mandate in terms of that particular position? Yeah, great question. I mean, I have the fortunate uh, privilege to work with a number of agencies that fall under what we call the health cabinet. So the Oklahoma Health Care Authority is part of that cabinet agency. So is the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Department of Health, uh, TSET, and a few licensors and boards. Uh, and so we are all focused on really driving health outcomes in Oklahoma and trying to drive the governor's agenda, which is to be a top 10 state, and that is in health. And all these agencies has a contribution to it, amongst other agencies that are outside the health cabinet. Now, there has been this issue for the past 18 months in Oklahoma. I think everybody knows what it is. And we have seen a lot of, um, shall we say, there's disagreements in terms of policy, a big divide between red and blue states. We all know this. In your position, and, and you're relatively new to this position, what, about a year now at uh, Healthcare Authority? I've been about two years at the Healthcare Authority, about a year plus uh, at the sec sec as Secretary of Health. How are we doing on pandemic? And I know you work closely with the Commissioner of Health. That would be uh, uh, Mr. Fry. So how, do you, how does that all work together? Well, I'll tell you, we, we just did a, uh, a look back in terms of where we were and where we are now with our COVID response and our pandemic response. And I think everyone would be of the opinion that um, a lot of states, including us, were ill-prepared uh, with regards to this pandemic. It hit us uh, unexpectedly. And if you looked at where our preparation was, whether it was with PPE and testing capabilities and things of that, we had a lot of catch up to do. Um, but the work that was done in short order, I think is, is admirable, quite frankly. And where we are today compared to where we are day one when the pandemic is a marked difference, whether that's supplies of PPE, testing capabilities, uh, arrangements and availability from a hospitalization standpoint, even though that entire uh, sector of the healthcare um, sector has been under siege. Uh, the healthcare workers in hospitals and others have been fatigued and stressed, and I certainly appreciate everything that they've had to endure. Um, but, you know, thinking about where we were, where we came from, and where we have moved towards, you know, I have to look to the vaccination process. Um, we were playing catch up on just the preparation and being able to respond, but we had sufficient notice to know that we had the ability to roll out a vaccination program and I would say that it was done very, very well. Uh, I think you would probably agree that for those that participated in that, whether that was a provider community, uh, community partners, as well as actual recipients of the vaccine would say it was a very well done job. Um, and so I think what, when faced with an issue, I think we responded quite well. I think there is obviously different points of view with regards to how to utilize the solutions and the uh, the availability of different types of options to deal with a pandemic like this. And we're gonna debate those now and then probably into the future. But in terms of our response, I, I was pretty pleased with what we've been able to accomplish given the fact of where we were starting off. It's interesting on our Monday night program, we very seldom see any with the doctors that I work with on Monday nights, they've never been, by the way, regardless of administration, They've never been happy with the communications coming from public health, from medicine, all across the board. I mean, they would never give them a pass grade. Dr. Armitage has a conniption fit once a week just about what CDC or FDA has said. But the question then would be, when you've had to deal with a lot, when you're dealing with not only is, is the Secretary of Health, but we're seeing numbers about DV being up in Oklahoma, um, suicide rates, and, and that is in your purview over the Department sure. of Health and Substance Abuse Services. So before we get into the healthcare authority hat that you wear, you see all of the things that have been going on in terms of not what, what we just mentioned, but also there are people who have not gone to their doctors, who've not gotten their checkups, who've neglected other things. Uh, elective surgeries have had to be curtailed. How big of a 
uh, of a problem or how big of a worry is that for you in your role in looking forward? Well, we've been watching that, Scott. I mean, we do have a dashboard, if you want to use that, it's just a, a key indicator of where things are and what they're possibly moving towards. And substance abuse is one, suicide rate is another. And certainly we thought about what were going to be the consequences of all of our actions with regards to responding to the pandemic. When you think about isolation, you think about access, um, all of those became part of the, the discussion in terms of we need to be prepared not only for the current, but the knock on effects that could be arising. And we certainly have seen that. And I know the teams with regards to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services are on point on those kinds of things. Department of Health has been monitoring those kinds of things as well as dealing with the pandemic at hand. Um, but no question, um, there was going to be some impact with regards to the pandemic that went beyond just the pandemic itself in terms of what it caused. Um, and we see that in a lot of different places. We see that in just the whole labor market, quite frankly, with regards to healthcare workers and how are we going to respond to that in terms of manpower and people power and development of talent and things of that nature. So clearly that was something that was on our radar and certainly on our radar now. And we're having to deal with it and responding to it accordingly. Before we get into the hat that you wear at Healthcare Authority, give our viewers and listeners a little idea about Kevin Corbett. I think people are interested in your background and in some of the media coverage of the last few weeks, it might be, well, I bet that he's a doctor or I'll bet his area is uh, in public health or something along those lines. I think everybody would be surprised really at your background, which is exemplary, but people may not have, you may not have had a lot of time to explain to people where you come from. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm a native Oklahoman. Uh, I, my entire career was really spent in, I'll call it the professional services uh, private sector. Uh, I worked for a professional services firm, uh, primarily in a consulting role. Um, I, I was here in Oklahoma, moved to Houston, have worked all over the country as well as the, the globe. And quite frankly, what I find that was so interesting about my career is I had the ability to work with so many other types of companies, regardless of sector, regardless of industry, to really see how best companies operate. And that, like I said, it doesn't necessarily result in just any one particular sector or one particular industry. And how they manage people, how do they manage boards, how they manage customers. And when I thought about the opportunity that Governor Stitt provided to me, which was to take on an agency that had the ability to manage and help and support a million Oklahomans, um, I'd seen that elsewhere, uh, call them customers, call them constituents, call them clients. Um, it was really a kind of nature to me to do something like that and have the opportunity to be in the game, if you will, and have that kind of impact. So it was a natural transition to me. No, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a healthcare expert. But what I have had the opportunity to do is understand best practices and how others have been successful in all sorts of arenas and all sorts of conditions that they find themselves in. Because no company is subject to static operations or static situations. They have to respond. Um, and this is no different. So I, I took it as a real opportunity from the sense is that I've already seen it before. I've had the opportunity to work with others and been quite, quite successful at it. I've seen others that have not been successful. So I was going to take the best of what I had learned over the last 38 years and hopefully do some good here in the state and make a contribution back in my home state. It should also be pointed out that a lot of your predecessors were not doctors or have healthcare backgrounds either. That's in fact, I don't know that I can remember any of them that had were uh, doctors or physicians um, in that uh, in that aspect of it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the hats you wear at the Healthcare Authority. For okay. people who pay a little attention to the news, you've been in the news quite a bit. Let's go back to a, a year and a half ago or so, whenever the Oklahomans decided to do Medicaid expansion. There was a lot of discussion prior to the vote. The voters said, we want to do this. There was a campaign. You didn't run the campaign. So I didn't I'm, just, I'm beginning to wonder, and I look at different stories that people write, and I go, were there things that were promised by the proponents in the campaign that maybe in a year and a half since that campaign that didn't quite turn out to be true or things changed? Are you grappling with the sort of situations that the voters were told you would be grappling with at this time? 
Well, it's still a little early. You know, we were really in the throes of uh, about two and a half months of actually launching our Medicaid expansion program here at the Healthcare Authority. And by the way, I think the team here has done a great job of rolling that out. Um, if you think about it from a standpoint of a new program, the opportunity to serve another 200,000 Oklahomans and be able to provide them health care that maybe they have not received in, in years, if not decades. Um, I'm very proud of what the team's been able to accomplish. I mean, we are now at about 180,000 uh, new members to the Medicaid program. Um, we're treating them as we have treated all of our members, and we believe we're a member first organization. We uh, certainly have obligations to the legislature, to the governor, to the taxpayers, but we really think about ourselves as member first um, and making sure that they have the ability to access health care regardless of their ability to pay and hopefully increase their health outcomes. Um, so what was what was promised to the to the the taxpayers uh, and those that voted for state question 802 was that we'd expand Medicaid and we would do that on July 1 of this year. And we would do it on the basis of existing programs that our current members are receiving with no further complications or limitations. Um, that is a state question. Therefore, it's in the Constitution. It's obligated for the legislature to fund that. Um, and they have done that for this year. Um, and so we're really kind of off to the races of doing what we're here to do, which is serve. Um, the process in which the Medicaid expansion became real obviously differed from what the governor had proposed early on that we were prepared to execute on that, uh, which was different than where we are today. We are thinking about certain flexibilities that might be available and necessary to be able to apply to this population. State question limited those flexibilities, but for the most part, you know, our role is to ensure that we treat these members like any other member and provide service to them. The question would be how many more Oklahomans are going to be covered under Medicaid expansion? There was some numbers during the campaign, but in reality, once you start implementing this, what do you see in terms of numbers? Yeah, so far we may, we estimated that we probably have another 200,000 new members, uh, true new members to win our program. Like I mentioned, we're about 180,000 new members today into the expansion population, as I call it. That probably needs to be qualified just a bit. Um, the thing about Medicaid expansion amongst anything else in terms of being able to serve those that hadn't been served before, called the un uninsured or underserved, um, is the ability for the federal government to participate in this program in a differential way than that they did previously with our existing population. I think your viewers probably might be aware that the federal government pays a large share of the cost of our Medicaid program. For our expansion population, they have even pay a greater share. Um, and so long story short, we've had a number of members that we've currently been pro uh, providing service to that now qualify as an expansion member. They're not a new member to the program. So of the 180,000 of the new of the expansion members, about 100,000 are new members to the program at all. And so we're about halfway through our estimates in terms of trying to reach another, to get to about 200,000 new members. And we're feeling pretty good about that number. I mean, all, all of our data, all of our analysis suggests that that's pretty spot on. One of the things that was said was that there's going to be uh, you're going to Medicaid expansion would save rural hospitals. There would be a lot of people getting primary care that would not get uh, primary care. And then I've seen some things that you've written about health equity. We know that's a big issue down the road. Can you comment about the rural health aspect of it, the primary care aspect of it? And then give us an idea of the demographics of these people that are in the program that are joining for the first time. Yeah. Um, first off, I mean, our, our, our view is, is that to increase health outcomes, we have to focus on preventative care and care coordination and care management. Um, certainly this population has not had the benefit of being able to utilize the entire health system as been established. Uh, they typically either do have not been receiving service or they've been receiving service where they have the ability to receive that largely from hospitals. Um, the Medicaid expansion allows us to increase the access to care as well as the compensation for care. Uh, as you probably know, the hospitals are uncompensated for the uninsured, but that's their community responsibility, and they've been they've been meeting that. But now we have the ability to, to access care throughout the entire health system. That's a goal of ours to make sure that our members, our new members, have familiarity and the ability to access that care, rather than where they typically might have received it in the past, which is through the hospital or the emergency room. Um, so far, um, you're right. I think you know we have rural access and we have urban access. 
rural has been much more difficult for us uh, than our urban uh, markets. Uh, being able to establish access and maybe even access on a conventional as well as an unconventional basis. Uh, you know, one of the things that COVID did allow us to do is think much more boldly and much more broadly about how do we access care. Um, and that meant really thinking that we can probably do some things that may be a little bit unconventional or at least not utilized in the past. And that's certainly something that we've done today. We're up to 2 million health uh, visits on a telehealth basis where prior to the pandemic, that was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20,000 a year. Um, so that is a opportunity to create access in the rural communities as well as in the urban communities as utilize the capabilities that we may have to provide that access that may be outside of the conventional wisdom. As it relates to local hospitals, rural hospitals, the ability to be compensated for services that they previously provided uncompensated wise, I mean, certainly is, a, is an improvement. Um, not all of the patients that they have been serving in the past are going to necessarily need to be served at a hospital, but for the community itself, to the extent that we have primary care physicians and others that serve that community, uh, they have the ability to serve this population and do that on a compensated basis. You bring up uh, telehealth. It became a big deal, of course, during the pandemic, and it's on everybody's mind right now. And the federal government, the state is working on expanding uh, broadband. And how do you reach those people that don't have it right now? Well, you know, it's interesting. When we looked at um, where was our telehealth usage coming from and the nature of service that was provided, um, we were thinking that we'd probably see a lot more uh, gaps, if you will, in terms of availability because of broadband and things like that. It's not as pronounced as I would have thought it would be. That's not to suggest that there are not gaps there. Um, but it certainly was uh, able to be provided through community partners and others that provided that access by technology and things of that nature. Rather than going to a doctor's office, they went to uh, you know a library and used uh, the technology that was at the library and things of that nature. But it still is an issue to try to get technology in the hands of all of our citizens so they have the ability to use it uh, as, as, as it's necessary and it's available. Well, it's going to be an interesting challenge, of course. Now, for the program, October 1st is a big date. So what's next in terms of people that are trying to get enrolled in Medicaid through the expansion program? Well, right now, as I said, we've, we're up to about 180,000. I think our numbers would suggest that we need another 100,000 to get to our, our goal of 200,000, our estimate of 200,000. Right now, we are working with community partners throughout the state to to try to get the word out and encourage and make and make aware of the program that's available to our to our citizens. Right now, if you look across the state, you know we have certain uh, levels of uh, enrollment that is quite healthy in terms of the percentage of available uh, eligible members, and then we have certain parts of the state that we still have some work to do. So we're working across counties right now and our community partners in those counties to encourage uh, and to to make aware of the program and the eligibility for the program and help in the assistance of enrolling in the program. We've had great participation, like I said, from the, the, the county library systems, the Homeless Alliance, our hospitals, our community health centers, things of that nature. They all have pitched in to help enroll these new members, which has been fantastic. Let me ask a question about uh, a aspect of the government life that's essential in every healthcare plan, the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Okay, I, I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> um, I want to, I look at what, who does the health plan, what's in your network, the Supreme Court. It's a, so we all know what's been happening there. The Supreme Court got in and said, okay, you can't promulgate managed care. I want to ask about that in general in just a moment. But the Supreme Court has said, you got to involve the legislature in promulgating the rules for managed care. So with everything that's going on and, and people, sometimes they get confused. There's also McGirt in the Supreme Court, but that's the federal. It's so right. confusing if you're trying to figure all of this out. Right. But in terms of the CEO of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, what the Supreme Court said, how does it impact what you're doing? Yeah, fair question. As, as you know, and it does involve managed care, we took an, a, uh, an approach to move to changing the delivery system at the Health Care Authority as it related to our Medicaid program. Really on the basis and the true uh, expectation to improve health outcomes in Oklahoma. And make the system accountable for outcomes as much as just service delivery. 
Uh, and we believe managed care was the way to do that. We went about doing that on the basis that we believed that we had legislative authority to do that by virtue of prior uh, legislative actions that had been taken. We moved forward with that. We engaged with uh, some managed care organizations to partner with us. Uh, there was a, a, a filing made to challenge that in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that we did not have the authority that we believed that we did. And therefore, we, we voided the contracts and put managed care on hold. Um, and that's where it stands today. Um, we're having dialogue and continuous conversations about the path forward. But as it relates to the Supreme Court, they did rule that we did not have the authority at the time in which we executed the contracts with those third party organizations. And therefore, that's why they were avoided. The Supreme Court ruling came out after the legislature had, uh, had finished its business, if you will. Um, part of the legislative process resulted in a bill that was uh, authored by the, the legislature and allowed to go into law by the governor, and that's Senate Bill 131. Uh, that bill was in response to the actions that we were taking at the time with regards to the contracts and the requirements for these third-party managed care organizations. That has been deemed to be kind of be called a, a, a guards rail bill at the time, which put in further mechanisms, further expectations on how we uh, managed and held the managed care organizations accountable. Um, and so what was part of that bill um, was an obligation on the healthcare authority to promulgate rules to put that law into action. This is no different than what we do throughout our entire organization on a routine basis. You know, the Medicaid program is, is, is complex, has numbers of laws, regulations, rules, and we've been a party to all that process. Our, our team does a great job of of rulemaking and putting those forth. And one of the things that we were doing with regards to 131 was simply that, which is to, to develop rules to implement Senate Bill 131 that we are obligated to do. Uh, I recognize that 131 has some connotations and some uh, connections, obviously, to managed care. Uh, our position on establishing rules was not to, to suggest any position on managed care. It was to honor the obligation which we had, which is to put rules in place, like we do for all other obligations to put rules in place, um, as that law became effective, which became effective September 1. Let me ask you about um, something else that's confusing to a lot of people. The legislature a few years ago gave Governor Stitt the ability to hire and fire at five big agencies, including the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. Governor Stitt hired you, where in the past it had been boards that hired you. And there has been quite a bit of discussion about the recent move with your board members. Well, in the nonprofit world, which I've served on some boards, you know, the boards, they set the policy and they get out of the way, the executive. It's not exactly how it works there, but give me an idea about you, you answer now to the governor, directly to the governor, what is the role of board members and how much do they influence what you do? And it seems there's this great deal of confusion as to precisely what an Oklahoma Health Care Authority board member now does. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and, and certainly the roles and responsibility of boards uh, is something to, be, to understand and, and appreciate. But in terms of what I think about a board, and the value that I receive from a board, regardless of its 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 charter, if you will, is the advice and counsel and uh, and the ability to seek input from these board members. Uh, I get great value out of that. If you think about this is an eight billion dollar business that we run, uh, being the CEO of that and having responsibility for 600 people, uh, I, I want to have the access to those that can help me execute my responsibilities. And I look for the board to do that um, as it relates to their authority. Um, Certainly that's a question in terms of what is the charter and what does the statute say? I mean, our board has certain obligations uh, that are clear in the statute for them to execute. One of them is to approve rules that we're required to put in place. Another is to approve certain levels of expenditures um, with third parties. Um, there is a question on how much further their authority goes, um, but I look at it more in terms of the value that they contribute. And that is advice, counsel and support for me and the organization and the role that we play in the state. All right, thank you for that answer. Let, let me go back to the first hat that you wear as we kind of wrap this up. You had mentioned your focus is on preventive care at, at Healthcare Authority. And we look across uh, the board at some of our outcomes. We just saw some numbers dealing with obesity. We see we're slipping in uh, smoking rates. We see diabetes on the rise. 
BMI numbers on the rise, um, mental health or mental illness on the rise. You know, stop me when I get to some good news. But from a, from your role at both at the Healthcare Authority and as the Secretary of Health and Mental Health, how do you approach and do you have the tools in your toolkit to help us get to where we need to be on the other side of these problems, some of which have been exacerbated by the pandemic? Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, our role is to, to to assist with the access to and to help drive outcomes. I mean, we do not deliver health services, as you know. Uh, we have a tremendous provider network that we rely upon and we're grateful to have. Um, but the reality is, is that we all have to be committed to the ultimate goal of improving health for all Oklahomans. I mean, our vision at the Healthcare Authority is for all Oklahomans to be healthy and have access to quality healthcare regardless of the ability to pay. Uh, and that doesn't mean just one patient to one physician and things of that nature, it's all. Uh, and so our role is to make sure that we are assisting in terms of what are the strategies and what are the mechanisms to achieve that. And it's our belief that we need to coordinate care, we need to try to manage care, and we need to focus care where it has the greatest outcomes. And we believe preventative care um, not only at the medical side, but at the, at, the, at the mental side, as well as the social side, has to be part of the equation. And it's going to take all of us to be able to accomplish that. Um, so my role and the, the role of the healthcare authority is, is trying to make sure that we're focused on the big picture here, which is outcomes, but at the same time, making sure that the tactical execution of access to care is occurring and that organizational ecosystem, if you will, is coordinated. Um, that's why we think we need to change the delivery system today at the healthcare authority, where it's both incentivized and we're committed to outcomes for the entire population of our Medicaid program uh, versus just a simple execution and delivery of service. Finally, let me reiterate that we live in a state where a lot of people talk about personal responsibility and liberty and freedoms and these sorts of things and believe those uh, central tenets. What would you say going outside of your hat as a healthcare authority CEO and secretary of health and mental health to Oklahomans who are watching what's going on and saying, well, what do I need to do to help? What can I do to pitch in to help the folks that are trying to get us over the hump of all of these challenges? What can individuals do to assist you, the governor, the legislature, our medical professionals? What would your message to them be? Yeah, very good question. Um, first, I think be informed. Um, the reality is, uh, and we've said it a lot, and it sometimes it becomes a little bit just kind of uh, deafening, if you will, with regards to where we are from a health, can, health uh, outcome standpoint relative to other states. I mean, we said it so long that we've been 46th or 48th, maybe it's become numb uh, to that, but to, to not only be informed, but to be committed to change and demanding change from those that have a role to play. Um, and that's including citizens individually, that's the healthcare community, that's the state uh, agencies like the healthcare authority, is putting the, putting the obligation on all of us to deliver better. Um, certainly the governor has an aspiration and a desire to be a top 10 state. I would say I'd like for everyone to be committed to that same goal and to hold those that have a role to play accountable for delivery on that. Uh, so commitment, in, being informed and being committed to to improvement, I think will go a long way. I think when we make a demand of each other to be better than what we are, we have a tendency to do it. Uh, and so right now, if we can get a, a broader commitment to improving health outcomes than we have today, I think we have the opportunity to be successful. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time. I know you've got a tremendously uh, challenging job You've got challenging uh, topics to deal with and a, a great team over there at Healthcare Authority. You've got a legislature coming back to town. You've got all kinds of challenges. Um, I hope you're you know, keeping your blood pressure low, exercising regularly, eating well. You're doing all that, right? I'm doing all that. I probably could do it better, Scott. But what I'd tell you is, you know, you talk about challenges, you talk about problems, you talk about, you know, all these anxieties that we all face. But the reality is, is that it's kind of attitudinal as well. I look at them as real opportunities. I mean, you know, gosh, I came here for the opportunity to make a contribution. And I think there's plenty of opportunities for others to make contributions. So rather than kind of get down on this, I think it's just it's an opportunity to kind of say we're not going to allow it to, to maintain and we're going to change. So 
again, I'm more op optimistic than I am pessimistic on these kinds of things. Appreciate that optimism. Uh, we, we need that here in our state with the health challenges. For people that work in public health, like I do, at least serve on board, they're, you know, it's very concerning. And uh, you do have a, a difficult job in front of you, but thanks for your optimism. And thanks for being frank about some of these answers uh, to some really tough questions. Well, I'm happy to do it. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the dialogue. Uh, I think there's a lot that the others can offer as well as besides ourselves. And so I would just encourage those that have the opportunity to get involved, get involved. Uh, we could use the help. Well, thanks for your time. I hope that uh, this will be a fairly regular uh, occurrence whenever things are needing to be communicated directly to the public. I mean, we're very concerned about it, um, you know, in the media to try to make sure that you said be informed. We want to make sure that we get it without much filter. We want to make sure you can get your messages out there and we'll look forward to the feedback we get from that. We'll be happy to pass that along and hope to see you again real soon. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Okay. Kevin Corbett, the CEO of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, our guest today. Have a great day, Mr. Corbett. You do the same. Take care. You too.